long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by time spinning for right only. <laughs> we cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for free to vote. <laughs> No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not mind of mine. Some of you have come here out of red trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from Narrowdale sales. Some of you have come from areas where your fresh quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution, staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that honor and suffering is redemption. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and get those of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, <laughs> so even though we face the difficulties of the day and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created. <laughs> I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills. Sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners. Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. One day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, <laughs> sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of Freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day. Oh, in Alabama, with this vicious racism, with this governor having his lips dripping with the words of his original qualification. One day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls would be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. <laughs>
everyone be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go in jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. This will be the day when all of us will be able to sing with no meaning. I come to see us. We land of liberty and we are saved. And where my father's died, land of the silver side, from every mountain side, let freedom reign, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom reign from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom reign from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom reign from the heights of Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the smoke cap rockets of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the courageous smoke of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the stone mountain of Georgia. Yes, let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every city, from every hamlet, from every state, and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of us are still in black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, are on will be able to join the hands yes, and sing in the words of the old people spiritual. We at last, we at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you very kind to my friend. I listened to Ralph Abernathy and his eloquent and generous introduction, and uh, then thought about myself. I wondered who he was talking about. <laughs> it's always good to have your closest friend and associate to say something good about you. And Ralph Abernathy is the best friend that I have in the world. I'm delighted to see each of you here tonight in spite of a storm warning. You reveal that you are determined to go on in it. Something is happening in Minnesota, something is happening in our world. And you know, if I was standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general and panoramic view of the whole of human history up to now. And the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt. Jesus. I watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through a rubber across the Red Sea through the wilderness on toward the promised land. And in spite of its magnificence, I wouldn't stop there. I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus. And I would see Plato, 
<laughs> also in the human rights revolution. If something isn't done and done in a hurry, to bring the colored people of the world out of their long years their long years of hurt and neglect, the whole world is doomed. <laughs> now, I'm just happy that God has allowed me to live in this period, see what is unfolding. And I'm happy that he's allowed me to be a minister. I can remember I can remember when Negroes were just going around as Ralph has said so often scratching where they didn't itch and laughing when they were not tickled. <laughs> That day is all over. <laughs> we mean business now, and we are determined to gain our rightful place in God's world. And that's all this whole thing is about. We aren't engaged in any negative protests and in any negative arguments with anybody. We are saying that we are determined to be men. We are determined to be people. We are saying, we are saying that we are God's children. And that we are God's children, we don't have to live like we are forced to live. Now, what does all of this mean in this great period of history? It means that we've got to stay together. Amen. We all got to stay together. We've got to stay together, to together and maintain unity. You know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, you have a favorite, favorite formula for doing. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. That's right. Or <laughs> well, whenever the slaves get together, yes, something happens in Pharaoh's court, and he yes. cannot yeah. hold the slaves in slavery. When the slaves get together, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. Amen. Say so, Reverend. Say so. Now let us maintain your second then. Let us keep the issues where they are. The issue is injustice. The issue is the refusal of mentors. To be fair and honest in its dealing with its public servants who happen to be sanitation workers. Now we've got to keep attention on that. That's always the problem with a little violence. You know what happened the other day, and the press dealt only with the window breaker. I read the article. They very seldom got around to mentioning the fact that 1,300 sanitation workers are on strike, and that Memphis is not being fair to them, and that Mayor Loeb is in dire need of a doctor. They didn't get around to that. Once again, 
again and he's got to march again in order to put the issue where it is supposed to be. Wants everybody to see the thou. 1,300 of God's children here suffering. Sometimes going hungry. Going through dark and dreary nights. Wondering how this thing is going to come out. That's the issue. He's got to say to the nation, we know how it's coming out. When people get caught up, with that which is right, and they are willing to sacrifice for it, there is no stopping for it short of victory. <laughs> we aren't going to let any base stop. We are masters in our nonviolent movement. In disarming police forces, they don't know what to do. I've seen them so often. I remember in Birmingham, Alabama, we were in that majestic struggle there. We would move out of the 16th Street Baptist Church day after day. By the hundreds, we would move out. Bill Connor would tell them to send the dogs for them. They did come. We just went before the dogs singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn their around. Bill Connor next to say, bring the fire hoses on. If I said you the other night, Bill Connor didn't know history. He knew a kind of physics that somehow didn't relate to the trans physics that we knew about. That was the fact that there was a certain kind of fire that no water could put out. We went before the fire hole. We had known water. If we were Baptists or some other denomination, we had been immersed. If we were Methodists and some other, we had been sprinkled, but with new water. That couldn't stop us. We went on before the dogs, and we would look at them, and we'd go on before the water hoses, and we would look at it. We just go on singing over my head, I see freedom in there. <laughs> And we be thrown in the paddy wagons. And sometimes we were stacked in there like sardines in a can. They would throw us in, and old bull would say, Take them off. They did, and we were just thrown in the paddy wagon singing, We shall overcome. Every now and then we'd get in jail, and we'd see the jail looking through the window, being moved by a prayer. Being moved by the words that I saw. There was a power down which Bull Palmer couldn't adjust the dust. So we ended up transforming Bull into a steel and we won our struggle in Birmingham. <laughs> We've got to go on in Memphis just like that. I call upon you to be with us when we go out Monday. How about injunction? We have an injunction and we are going into court tomorrow morning to fight this illegal, unconstitutional injunction. All we say to America is be true to what you say on paper. That's right. <laughs> I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian. Maybe I could understand 
some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I can understand the laws of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they have committed themselves to that over that. Somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. Collectively, that means all of us together. 
from that today, we are richer than all the nations in the world with the exception of God. <coughs> you ever think about that? After you leave the United States, Soviet Russia, Great Britain, West Germany, France, I can name others. American Negro collectively is richer. And most nations of the world, we have an annual income of more than $30 billion a year, which is more than all the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada. You know that? That's power right there, if we know how to do it. <laughs> we don't have to argue with anybody. We don't have to curse and go around acting bad with our words. We don't need any bricks and bottles. We don't need any bottles. We just need to go around to these stores. And for these massive industries and outcomes, say God sent us by here to say to you that you're not treating his children right. And we come by here to ask you to make the first item on your agenda bad treatment where God's children are concerned. Now, if you're not prepared to do that, we do have an agenda that we must follow. And our agenda calls for withdrawing economic support from you. Amen, it did. This we ask in you tonight to go out and tell your neighbors not to buy Coca Cola in them. <laughs> Go by and tell them not to buy a chill test milk. Tell them not to buy what is all the bread wonder bread. <laughs> what is all the bread wonder bread? Tell them not to buy hard. Jackson has said up to now, only the garbage men have been feeling pain. Now we must find the reason for the pain. We are choosing these companies because they have been planning their hiring policies. We are choosing them because they can begin the process of saying they are going to support the needs and the rights of these men who are on track. Then they can move on town, downtown, and tell Mayor Lowe to do what is right. <laughs> you to take your money out of the banks downtown and deposit your money in Tri-State Bank. <laughs> you want a bank in Go by the savings and loan association. I'm not asking you something that we don't do ourselves in SDLC. Judge Hooks and others will tell you that we have an account here in the Savings and Loan Association from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We are telling you to follow what we are doing. Put your money there. We have six or seven black insurance companies here in the city of Memphis. Take out your insurance there. We want to have an insurance here. Now, these are the practical things that we can do. The 
to begin the process of building a greater economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. I ask you to follow through here. Now let me say as I move to my conclusion. And we've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. It means we need to work. It means we need to be there. Be concerned about your brother. You may not be on track. But either we go up together or we go down together. Develop a time of dangerous unselfishness. One day a man came to Jesus. He wanted to raise some questions about the vital matters of life. Once he wanted to trick Jesus, show him that he knew a little more than Jesus knew and throw him off base. That question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate. But Jesus immediately pulled that question from midair, placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. He talked about a certain man who fell among thieves. You remember that a Levite. The priest passed by on the other side. They didn't stop to help him. Finally, a man of another race came by. Got down from his feast. Decided not to be compassionate by proxy. But he got down with him, administered first aid. And helped the man in need. Jesus ended up saying this was the good man. This was the great man. Because he had the capacity to project the eye into the power to be concerned about his brother. Now, you know, we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. At times, we say they were busy going to a church meeting, an ecclesiastical gathering. They had to get on down to Jerusalem so they wouldn't be late for that meeting. At other times, we would speculate that there was a religious law that one who was engaged in religious ceremonial was not to touch a human body 24 hours before the ceremony. And every now and then we began to wonder. Hi, God, and everyone. Thank you for coming to my channel. Love you so much. Down to Jericho, rather, to organize a Jericho Road Improvement Association. That's a possibility. Maybe they felt that it was better to deal with the problem from the causal root rather than to get bogged down with an individual effect. I'm going to tell you what. That was a good, good one. I give you a wrench. You know you deserve it. Without you, I wouldn't be successful. Like that. Thank that you so much, God. Love you so much, honey. Nah, 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 nah. You see, the Jericho Road is a danger for I remember when Mrs. King and I were first. In Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. As soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as the Show me some love, guys, for this great speech, Mr. Martin Luther King. I'm going to hush my mouth because it's very important to me. Can I get a thumbs up, guys? Show me some love and I'll show it back. Drop your links, please. 
And I'll show somebody to get you some uh, watch hours. And I'll pay you playlists. Thank you so much for joining me. God bless you, Lord. Fifteen or twenty minutes later, you're about twenty-two hundred feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody paths. You know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. It's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely taken. He was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, lure them there for quick and easy seats. So the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Then the Good Samaritan came by. And he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. Not if I stop to help the sanitation worker, what will happen to my dog? Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That's the question. Lies <laughs> of life with a greater ready. Let us stand with a greater determination. Let us move on. In these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be, we have an opportunity to make America a better nation. I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. While sitting there autographing books, the minute black woman came up, the only question I heard from her was, you, Bob Luther King, and I was looking down writing, and I said yes. The next minute I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been standing by this divinity one. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. <coughs> that blade had gone through and that x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. Once that's functioned, Oh my God. You drowned in your own blood. That's the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, move around in the wheelchair in the hospital. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in from all over the states and the world. Kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and the vice president. I have forgotten what those telegrams said. I had received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I have forgotten what that letter said. There was another letter. It came from a little girl, a young girl, who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it. it said, Sympathy, Dr. King, I am a 
ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. She said, why it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. I want to say tonight. I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960. Students all over the South started sitting in at lunch house. I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream, taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had seen, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961. We decided to take a ride for free and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960. Because in Albany, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is dead. If I had sneezed, <laughs> Black people, Birmingham, Alabama, roused the conscience of this nation, brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, Would have been down in Selma, Alabama, to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. They were telling me. Now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning, and as we got started on the plane, that was six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we're sorry for the delay. But we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked. And to be sure that nothing would be wrong on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. Then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, I talk about the threats that were out. What could happen to me from some of our sick white brother. But I don't know what will happen now. <laughs>